invalid, which then are uh, absolutely to look at. One came up where it was uh, a guy from America who was saying that the blacks were actually the true Israelites. So I then went into the first of all, was resistance, but then I know there's been so much deception, so I thought, well, maybe that is the greatest deception of them all. And uh, I went into a couple of videos, started to, to look at it, and I accepted that. Confusion, but he also wanted certain things to be clear. And uh, to me, it's very, very clear that uh, the biblical Jews, uh, many of them are the so called Negroes in America, and that implies that, like the Bible says in many, many places, that Jesus is dark skin. You know, this is an invitation that my channel offers to people uh, to worship the God of the Bible uh, and for what it says. You know, but uh, the narrative that he has set forth for them. And uh, people who are enslaved worldwide, we all are to some degree. Uh, it's his plan, you know. But what they've gone through, um, being packed like sardines on cargo slave ships and sent here, and uh, the kind of torment that they were put under, uh, has to be in the Bible. There is no God who would ever allow something like that to happen on Earth and not have a particular reason for it. They were um, sewing um, uh, cats into a woman's womb. And uh, betting to see which one could come out fastest, scratch their way out. They were uh, using, you know, um, Negroes as like hater bait. Uh, they were obviously hanging them off trees, uh, you know, all that stuff. It was just a horrendous form of slavery uh, that happened to them. And again, there's slavery that happens worldwide to this day that is just as sinister. But for it to be with that large of a group and um, to have you know that type of impact you know on them as a group of people to this day, uh, to me, uh, has to be in the Bible or else the God of any religious text uh, would be completely oblivious to what's going on under their watch. And so, to me, that is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Ultimately, the enslavement uh, is prophesied for all of us uh, in the end times. But uh, that level of devastation has to be uh, for a spiritual purpose.
Colombia, in Africa, we have, um, whenever you see a guy that's like Christ, everybody goes crazy. And, and some people, if they head to church on Sunday and see somebody that's like Christ, they get all hysterical and they just go home because they saw Christ that day. And you see the last part of the video, the Central Asian traditional dance is seen throughout the Arabs, is seen in the Jews, is seen in Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. Because this is the true origin of the Ashkenazi Spartan Jews and the white Arabs. They come from Central Asia. And so when you look at what's happening in Israel, uh, say for instance the gay pride parade every year, because they're a violation of Leviticus 18.22, they should be going through the curse of Israel. But if you look at how much money we give Israel, the Jews in America and Europe, you would say that they're blessed. The Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, all those, all, they have just going on a whole spew of names and what they've accomplished in America and other, in other countries. So, in regards to the true church in Israel, we got to look at a lot of different things. And I'm going to touch on today um, some specific things because uh, I can just go on a whole tangent. Okay, so we look at Genesis 37. Notice in the story, Judah is the one that sells his brother, he tells his brothers, instead of just killing our brother Joseph, let's just sell him and then act like, you know, he got killed. And so he said, let's sell to the Ishmaelites so that our hand be upon him for he is our brother on flesh, so not our hand be upon him. And his brothers were saying, they said, okay, let's do it, Judah. Let's sell our brother Joseph and act like he got killed. And this is where the first selling of an Israelite or another Israelite happened. And it's not a coincidence that the tribe of Judah also got afflicted with slavery during the slave trade. So when you look at the Ashanti tribe in Ghana, um, the Gold Coast, or Cape Coast, originally there was trading for gold, but then they said, well, slaves is also a high commodity, and so they started selling slaves. And most of the um, slave ships, if they, if they left the Congo, they left Angola, they left Nigeria, they had a disembark disembarkation point where the last stop before they went to the Caribbean of the Americas was Cape Coast, Ghana. If you look at the palace of Cape Coast, Ghana, outside of the palace and different entrances, you'll see lion statues everywhere representing the tribe of Judah. There's a shot to say they come from the tribe of Judah. If you look at Cape Coast, you'll see Cape Coast Castle, I was slave for it. You also see Almina Castle, which is in Accra. But these castles and forts were built and occupied different times by the Portuguese, the, Sp the, Sp the Spaniards, the Denmark, the Sweden, Holland, Germany, Britain, and they made a lot of the slave trade and also the gold, gold, the gold coast, the gold, the gold trade. So when you look at the Ashanti Golden Stool, you'll see the Ashanti Golden Stool is significant to the Ashanti people. Uh, it believed to contain the soul of the Ashanti people, and they was thought that the stool ceased to exist so with their nation. The measurements and the dimensions of the Golden Stool is similar to the dimensions of the Ark of the Covenant. It is not allowed to touch the floor just like the Ark of the Covenant. It is laced with gold just like the, the seat the stool on top of the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. And so no king is ever allowed to touch it, never allowed to sit on it, and very few people have seen it. Back in the old days, when they would go to battle, they would have the priest carry the golden stool in front of the rest of the Ashanti warriors, and that ensured their victory. Just like the ancient Israelites carried the Ark of the Covenant with the priest in front of the, the rest of the, the warriors. If you look at Ghana, Ghana has probably the most slave force out of all the countries in Africa. It's from the western region down to the greater Accra region, to the Volta, to the Ashanti, to the central region. These are all forts that the Europeans occupied that was involved in the slave trade of Negroes. A whole lot of them. When you look at March 28, 1900, the British government called a meeting of all kings in and around the Ashanti city of Kumasi, ordered them to surrender the golden stool. Deeply insulted, the Ashanti silently left the meeting went home prepared for war. The Queen Mother, Nana, Ya Asantiwa, became the inspiring force behind the Ashanti. She was the one that made the speech saying that it isn't true that the bravery of the Ashanti people is no more. If you men of Ashanti will not go forward, then the women will. We, the women, will. I shall call upon my fellow women. We will fight the white men. We will fight till the last of us falls on the battlefield. The speech so moved the chief that once they swore the great oath, which is in the Bible, of the Ashanti, to fight the British until the Asante King Prepe was set free from his exile because he was exiled to another, to another island. 
This is the golden stool. And you see that just like the mercy seat and the Ark of the is laced in gold, it's like the golden stool is not how I touch the floor, so they use the blanket to put over it because the king is too holy to touch the ground. This is Martin King and former president of God back in the day, Kwame Nkrumah. You can see him sitting on the road, uh, well, the stool is right here sitting on his own seat, he's not touching the ground because even the seat is on, looks like a little mat. And if you look at the Gold Coast, they sold a lot of Negroes to Jamaica. Now, so you see here, these are Maroons. The Maroons, they were able to escape the Spanish and the British by going into the mountains with the Taino Indians. The Taino Indians, the same people that the Spaniards came and almost whacked off the, the island of um, Santo Domingo and also uh, Latana, which was basically the Taino Indians language for Puerto Rico, which they call Puerto Rico today. And here's how the Cape Coast Council looked back in the old days with the British Jack Union flag. And then here you see the Maroons. They blow what's similar to a chauffeur horn. This is like actually a cow horn. Um, but they blow it in the same manner as the, the Hebrew Israelites blow the shofar, the shofar horn back in the old days. And here you see 10 likely Gold Coast new Negroes. So the abeng is what they blow. It's a cow's horn slash shofar. It sends messages to the community. Messages included warnings of imminent attack to evade capture. They announce the birth of a baby. Notice the death of a member. They keep in touch with blowing the shofar in different ways during a war. So just like the shofar can be blown in different ways, you can blow the, the abang in different ways. One sound that not only does it alert the community, every one of the warriors, the women, and even children know what to do. And also, when the British and the Spaniards were coming into the island, they would just blow shofars all over the place. So it would confuse the enemy because they would think that these people are all over the place. So that's how they kind of defeated and had an official treaty signed with the British that they were to leave them alone and not enslave um, the rest of the Maroons or the rest of the Negro Gold Coast slaves that fled into the mountains from the Spanish. Same thing with the Taino Indians. So today, the been used in ceremony activities on the symbolic national occasions. It's also used to alert community of important events. This is a short video I'm going to show you of uh, the Maroons. This is the Maroons on the left, the one that I'm in the jungle.
The young key poem is how you say the Almighty God in the Ashanti and Fanti language in, in Ghana. So this is how you know slavery existed, despite some people saying that slavery never existed, like Danny Conway and others. But from the people in Jamaica, they are still saying and speaking the old dialect, or the dialect they're still speaking in, in Ghana. The Fanti and the Ashanti, the Akans in Ghana today. Alright, so when you look at this map, you'll see that I have here Judah, 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 Judah. Now, the kingdom of the Congo is said to be from the tribe of Judah. And they sold, sold slaves from the Loango coast, the Loango uh, slave fort, and also Cabina, which is over here like, near Angola, Luango, Cabina, Angola. Then you had Badagri in Nigeria coast of the Bight of Biafra, the Bight of Bani. Then you also have the Gold Coast, where the Ashanti say they are also of the tribe of Judah. When you go to Benin, the old Dahomey Empire, you see Oyuda, Oida, and I'm going to talk about the kingdom of Judah that was sold as slaves uh, in the old Dahomey kingdom, which is basically Benin is right next door to Togo, and also next door to Nigeria. And then you see here Fort James is Kuta Kite Island, and Gambia and Goree Island is in Senegal. When you talk to the Mandingo people in the Senegal Gambia area, they also claim to be from the tribe of Judah, uh, the sense of, of the Israelites that were exiled uh, to Babylon during the Babylonian siege, and they also migrated eventually into Africa and also into Spain and Portugal for the Spanish Inquisition. Now, the Ashanti king is seated in the state with princes on his garment. It's in the Book of Numbers. The customs of the Israelites were to wear fringes, especially the royals and the chiefs. Uh, they actually have all types of royal garments with fringes. Just like you can see Israelites today wear fringes. And a lot of people haven't seen a lot of fringes being worn by African tribes, but we're just wearing fringes because we know that's in the Bible and tassels. But this is actually what the Israelites wore, and you can see the Dinka symbols on the garment of the Ashanti king. Numbers 1538 says, Speak to the children of Israel and bid them that they, were, that they make fringes on the borders of the garments for the generations. The Ashanti king is wearing fringes. This is also a fringe that's also um, that you would see wear by a priest. So these fringes right here is got from a specific grass, which is used as a roof of houses in ancient Israel and in most villages in Africa. In the same way that the ancient Israelites built their houses with mud and straw. And they put stuff on top of it, like in the Sukkot, in the booths, in the wilderness. It's the same way that the ancient Ghanaians and ancient Bounces people made their poems and, and the same dress. The same thing. Torah culture is Bounces Negro culture in Africa. So here we see the sword holders that represent the sin guy of the Ashanti kings. Twelve swords represent the twelve tribes, twelve clans of the Akan people. They got twelve swords. The Ashanti king, 12 shields that guides him, symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's 12 guys right there. Now, when you look at next door to Israel, you see that you have Ammon and Moab. Ammon and Moab, today is the modern name Jordan. And here you see Ammon or East, Esau or Edom. Now, the ancient Moabites and Ammonites, the original inhabitants were people of color, not the modern day Jordanian people and the Jordanian king. As you can see here, Jordan, Petra, Barak, Mount Seir, the Horites. As you see here, the majority of the people standing here are people of color, including their leader, which is another man of color. Whoever controls the printing press, the books and magazines, and the media controls history. This is in Akaba, Jordan, 1918. These are the real Jordanians. When you look at the real Ishmaelites, the Torahites, you will see that they are better than people. King Abdullah II of Jordan, he, his ancestry is from Central Asia, like the Ottoman Turks, the Okus people, the Uzays, Uzbek, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan. This is where he's from. His DNA goes back to the Jephetic lineage, lineage or the sons of Jephet. So we look at Psalm 83, there's a reason why 
the Israelites throughout the world have had a hard time under the rulership of Japheth. Remember the Bible said, Japheth, Japheth shall dwell in the tents of Shem. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. You gotta look at where the British has gone, the Germans, the Spanish, all these nations. They've been all the way to the Pacific Islands, they've been to British India, they've been to British Virgin Islands, Jamaica, South America, North America, the Caribbean, Africa, they've been everywhere. So when we look at the confederate that have came against the children of Israel back in the old days to cut them off from their nation, you gotta look at the tabernacles of Esau, the Israelites, the white the Hagarines, Ammon, Ashur is also joined with them, helping the children of Lot, Ammon and Moab. Here we see the black Bedouins. The black, they just term black Bedouins because they don't want to give them a term as Moabites and Ammonites and Ishmaelites and Turites. Because they don't want you to know that these guys have the DNA that connects themselves to the sons of Abraham or the, 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 the people that are related to Torah and Nabor and all these other people that are Semitic. Here we see that the Semitic blood is still seen in Northeast Africa, in Egypt and Sudan, mixed in with the DNA of the white hairs so that the hair is a little bit more straight but the skin tone still remains the same. This is actually in Nubia, Nubia, which is basically Sudan, uh, Lower Egypt. So the questions people are asking now, because of the internet and YouTube, who are the original sons of Shem? Who are the real Shemites? Are the Arabs real Shemites? No, they're not. Look at the people in Yemen. There's a lot of different variations of skin tones and hair textures and facial features in Yemen. This guy looks more Negro, he looks more black, if you want to say, than your typical Yemeni or Yemeni Jew. Also, the question on the table is, was the ancient Egyptians white, meaning Nordic, or were they black? This is an Egyptian old man from 1400 BC, blonde hair, Nordic facial structure has been well preserved. This is what somebody put on, on the head of it. Who are the original sons of Ham? Of course, in the movies, we see the Egyptian pharaohs and Moses as depicted as Caucasians. But is that the truth? Who was the original Israelites? Who, what about these people? Who are, who are these people? What about the Australian Aborigines? People in India, people in Tibet, Nepal, with dark skin tones in, in, in the Asian features. People in Peru, in Chile, Argentina, brown-skinned, so-called indigenous Indians or Latinos, whatever you want to classify them. Where do they get their melanin from? Is it from the sons of Japheth? Is it from the sons of Ham? Is it from the sons of Shem? What about these people in India? Who are they? They're in India. Are the Adivasi, the Dravidians, these people have a biblical ancestry. Are they the sons of Japheth? Are they the sons of Ham? Are they the sons of Shem? Well, I do a lot of lectures on the sons of Ham, excluding that the people in India are Hamites. So they're not Hamites, they're not related to Alexander the Great and the Grecians and Thrace and the Romans and Spaniards and Latin and all sorts of stuff. Then they have to be sons of Shem. Notice how her facial features look sort of Negroid, but she got straight hair. In the black community, you go to the beauty spot store and get straight hair and, and wear the same clips or take them out. You can wear nose rings. And you would think this black this girl right here is a black girl, but she's actually from India. She's the original dwellers of India. That's the word Adavasi means the original dwellers of India. And you see that they have dark skin tones, just like black people. Some people might look at this girl and say, this is a black girl doing another person's hair. If you put a black girl in her place, you would think this is a black girl with a nice weave doing another black girl's hair. And you see the original Arabs in Saudi Arabia and Yemen. They don't look like the typical white Arabs that we see today. They don't look like Saddam Hussein. They have more Negroid features and they have more melanin in their skin. What about the Turek people? They don't have the DNA as the Negro or African Americans. They look black, but they have some DNA that ties them to the ancient Arabs, to the ancient Libyans, and the ancient Egyptians. What about the Turek people in the Atlas Mountains scattered through Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, Morocco? These people look black. But their DNA is not the same as the so-called Negro. Are uh, these the ancient descendants of the ancient Puttites, the ancient Egyptians? They live in North Africa. The original Arabs, the Ottoman Turks from Central Asia, running into the original or somewhat close to the original Arabs in Arabia and Yemen. Notice how their darker skin tones, even though it's a black and white, black and white picture, and they don't have anything on their chest. But they're all covered up. They have the, the typical furry hats that you see in Central Asia. The white Jews also wear furry hats as well. People in Russia, and they do those dances, and they kick and twirl, and they walk this and that, go in a circle. That's a Central Asian tradition. The original Arabs fighting against the Assyrians, 
The Syrians are trying to cartoon in the Arabs. The Arabs are running around on camels and horses. These are the Syrians. Notice the, the original Arabs, they have bare back, just like the picture we saw earlier right here. And they're barefoot too. They don't have no shoes on like these guys have. They don't have shoes either. Who are these people? In Libya, in Niger, in Mali, in North Nigeria, Chad, the Turek people, are they the ancient Libyans? I'll touch on that. The Nubians, the Egyptian Nubians. Notice how she looks kind of different. That looks like she could be a Native American Indian woman back in the day. Here we see Blackfoot Indian, a real Blackfoot Indian, but his DNA is not even B1A, which is the DNA of most African Americans. This person's DNA is Q. So Samuel uh, has been working for him to DNA, but he says, my family was told me I was Blackfoot Indian. He gets a DNA test, and it turns back that he's related to the Igbo tribe of Nigeria, and his white DNA is even B1A and not Q. And he's not a black Indian. He descends from West Africa, from the Israelites, on that end. So you see, before the French and the Europeans broke up the noses of ancient Egypt, that the ancient Egyptians were Negroid. They had full noses, wide noses, and full lips. They were black. Moses was mistaken for an Egyptian. Joseph was mistaken for an Egyptian. So much so that his brothers didn't even notice that Joseph was standing, Joseph was standing amongst the other Egyptians. Here we see a black Egyptian mummy. Here we see an Egyptian bareback with no fringes on the garments. Now, notice the complexion of the Egyptian mummy. This is Egyptian pharaoh Tutmosis III, the 18th dynasty of Egypt. Many people believe that Tutmosis I lived during the time of Moses in Queen Hatshepsut, around 1500 BC. Notice that his skin complexion is dark, is black. And when you go to a funeral, of a dark skinned African American, and you see them in the casket, they usually are what? They, they're dark, right? They're a lot darker than what they were when they were in real life. This is the mummy of a Caucasian. Anybody that works in the morgue that does gross anatomy knows that when black people die, we get darker. When Caucasians and lighter races die, they, they stay white or they get more white. So we know that the ancient Egyptians were not white people, they were black. The Israelites, Joseph's first wife was Egyptian. King Solomon had an Egyptian wife. Out of Joseph and the Egyptian woman came Manasseh and Ephraim, two of the 12 tribes of Israel. This is in the Bet Alpha Synagogue in northern Israel, the binding of Isaac. This is Abraham. This is Abraham in Hebrew. And this is Isaac. This is Isaac. This is the altar. This is the sword he's supposed to kill Isaac with. And here's the ram in the thicket. Notice how Abraham's face is dark and he has an afro. Notice that his arms and his feet have been whitewashed. He has an afro. This is Greek. This is Aramaic Hebrew. This is Greek. Notice they tried to, to lighten his face, but they forgot to do the upper part. These are the pictures of Negroi cherubim angels found in Israel. Excavations in Samaria and Israel uncovered numerous iron plaques which one, once decorated a palace or a temple. Notice the Negroid features of the angels, not Europe or Caucasian figures in here. These are the Hebrews, Hebrews that were taken captive in the siege of the Kish in the Bible, the Micah, Second Kings Chronicles. Notice how they have fringes on their garments. They have the symbols in the line, and they have dreadlocks, and they have a beard. Close-up picture, you can see that these guys don't resemble the Ashkenazi smart Jews to this day. They look like black people. You see one, two, three, four, five, six rolls, like corn rolls, on one side of his head. And the other side might have seven, too. These are the, the Hebrews again being led away captive into captivity by the Assyrians. The Assyrians right here, notice the Hebrews have kinky hair, tight curled hair. It's a better picture right here. The siege and capture of the Judean or tribe, well, basically the Kish was a fortress city outside of Jerusalem in southern Israel. Um, this was under 700 BC under the Syrian king, Senatrio. The Hebrews in the Kish were captured by the Syrians, as you can see, and they have kinky hair, typical of a black person. You can find this in your Bible, my Bible, 2 Kings 18, 
2 Chronicles, Michael 1, 13, and in the annuals of King Senebshwip, which they found in Nineveh, the capital of Assyria at the time. Today, Nineveh is in northern Iraq, the place where Chaldeans say they come from. A close picture, tight curl here, tight curl here. These look like Negroes to me, not the Ashkenazi Jews. Notice that they don't have the twisty sideburns that the Jews have and the Yemenite Jews have, because that's not a rich like custom or tradition. Here's another picture from the relief in the British Museum. The British steal all the good treasures and all the artifacts and they keep it hidden in their museums. The museums of Britain, the museums of France, the Cairo Museum in Egypt. But they're not going to have this in America because they don't want people to look at this and say, wait a minute, this looks like black people. So that we can start waking up. They keep it everywhere else because they know we don't travel to France and Europe and Britain and Cairo, Egypt to see these kind of reliefs. So we know that, that by looking at the reliefs, the stone reliefs of the real Hebrews, we could tell that, that they were people of color, they were Negro people. The only Negro people typically have tight curl hair and tight curl beards, as you can see here. This is this when, when the Jews have stuff in their museums, the University of Haifa, Israel, Rubin, and Eden Head Museums, they always term anybody who looks kind of Negro as a Phoenician or a Canaanite. Because they don't want to say, they don't want to put right here the Israelite. Because they don't mean, well, this guy does not look like a Sephardic Jew or a Hasanic Jew. So when they put this on display in museums, they're going to put down here a Phoenician, which is basically Greek for Canaanite. Now, who were the Jews during the times of Christ? Flavius, Josephus, the Greco Roman Gentile Jewish convert, discusses the Edomite occupation in southern Judea. Judea period. He said that country is also called Judea and the people are called Jews. And this name, meaning Jews, is given also to as many, as many as embrace their religion, Judaism, though of other nations. So you can be of other nations, as long as you follow the Torah and follow the God of Israel, monotheism, then you're classified now as Jews. I suppose it was because they had a long time been driven out by the, well, I think I messed up right here, but anyway, it says, but then upon what foundations of the government as high creators at first, took upon ourselves to compel these Idumeans or Edomites either to become Jews or to leave their country. Now remember, we can't become of the tribe of Judah. You can't become of the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Issachar or Reuben. You can't become that because that's a birthright. It's a birthright. You gotta be born to a parent or a father that's of the tribe of Judah. So to become a Jew means conversion, religious conversion. The Maccabees' father, Mattathias, was born in the third century BC. He died in 167 BC. Joseph has said that the Jews found it difficult to speak Greek and that they all spoke Aramaic at the time of the Maccabees. Jewish Encyclopedia says they were then incorporated into the Jewish nation, meaning the Edomites, and their country was called by the Greeks and Romans Idumea. From this time, the Idumeans ceased to be a separate nation, though the name Idumea still existed in the time of Jerome. It says here, the first century historian Joseph says that they were hereafter no other than Jews. Notice how in the book of Esther, it says that every province and every city would serve the king's commandment and his decree came. The Jews had joy and gladness a feast and a good day, and many of the people of the land in Persia became Jews, meaning they converted to Judaism. For the fear of the Jews fell upon them. The word Jew is in the book of Esther seven, four times. The word Jew is in the Tanakh only three times. It's not in the Torah, it's only in the Tanakh. And this discrepancy is between the Septuagint and the Hebrew Bible and the King James Bible in terms of the word Jew and how they use it. So the word Jew was inserted into the Tanakh for a reason. Now notice that Joseph Flavius said that during his time, back in his time, that they found it very difficult to speak Greek because that wasn't their mother tongue. Their mother tongue was supposedly Hebrew and Aramaic. But if you look at the Shidiya synagogue in 240 BC, around the time of Mattathias, the father of the Maccabees, Judas Maccabees the Hammer, is Greek. Everything's written in Greek. The Shia synagogue is in Maccabees 4, Maccabees, Maccabees book 4. Because you have 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees, 3rd Maccabees, and 4th Maccabees. If you read up, you'll see the Shia synagogue 
was also the place where the Maccabees lived, and also the Alexandria synagogue. But the Alexandria synagogue, the Alexandria Jews, the Maccabees Jews, they weren't writing and reading and speaking Hebrew. They're supposed to mother tongue. They were writing, speaking, and reading Greek. Even in Africa, even though you have a working language such as Swahili and English and French and Portuguese, people in Africa still have a mother tongue. They still have a mother tongue. Just like in America, we can speak English, but if you're German, you may also know how to speak German. If you're from Rome, Italy, you, speak, you know how to speak Latin plus English. If you're from uh, Spain, you're from Puerto Rico, you can speak English and Spanish. So why would the real Israelites speak and write in the synagogue in, a, in the language of another nation? I mean, the synagogue is supposed to be a place of worship. A place of worship. Here we see again, 200 BC, Alexandria Synagogue, Greek, on marble. Here we see, now we, now we see in 250 AD, in Alexandria, Alexandria Synagogue, now we see our bank. It's like they got a point, and they said we got we, we learn Hebrew now, and now we can write. But when the Jews at that time would die, and they would get buried, and they have tombstones, it would always be Greek with a menorah. They're not true Israelites. The Maccabees weren't true Israelites. They were Greco-Roman Gentile converts. Now let's go back to the Egyptians. Now here we see a skull of Ramses the second and Seti. Notice from the side view, you'll see that. He does not have a prognathous, a protruding jaw. His nasal ridge is right here, and his jaw kind of goes back and it comes, comes, comes out. All right? And it, a lot of people say, well, look at his skull feature and his face feature. The Egyptians were white. They were Caucasian. Look at his features. But when you look at cranial metric analysis, you'll learn about orthogonathism and prognathism and brachycephalic. And if you follow the line down, of the nasal bone, the gobella, the nasal bone, all the way down. Now you can see that the line is crossed over by the mandible and the maxilla. He has his head to the back, so you really can't see it. But notice the slender features of his face, slender face, nice brown head, not a prognathous jaw. Prognathous jaw, protruding jaw. Australian Aborigines, Negroes. Negroes, protruding jaw. Now, depending on who the Israelites are mixed with, you can develop some of the characteristics. When you look at the Hutu, you see a difference than the Tutsis. The Tutsis, the Tutsis know as the, as the Jews of Kush, because they did spend a lot of time in, in ancient Egypt and ancient Kush. So there's a difference between their skull shapes, even though they have the same DNA, even the one a those are the DNA of Ramses, the first and second, and Seti is not the same as DNA as the Hutus and the Tutsis. Negro, part natural jaw, he goes past the red line. This is orthogonathic surgery, so this is where your jaw is pushed back, which in some races is normally back behind the nasal ridge. They have ways they can, they can push it forward. So now you see the chin is more forward instead of going backwards. This is the skull they found in Israel, in Kaf Zed Israel. Notice the skull is prognathous. The skull is prognathous like the Negro skull. Now you look at the ancient DNA of the Israelites, you'll see different types of DNA found in the skeletons they found in ancient Israel skeletal remains. Israel, the Tufian, pre powery Neolithic B period, pre powery Neolithic C. You see the DNA of the Australian Aborigines, the DNA of the Dravidian, South Indian, and South Indian, Tamil Nadu, and, and uh, Kerala, Sri Lanka. You see the DNA of the Negro, E1B1A. You also see E1A, E1B1A. Also the DNA of the Edomite influence, because the, the Edomites were in Israel. The DNA of the Egyptians. Remember the, the scripture about the Egyptian man and the Israelite woman? They were storming together in the camp together. The Egyptians were also left with a mixed multitude. We also see the DNA of the Arabs, the Ishmaelites, the descendants of Abraham in the Jordan region of Ammon and Moab. Up here in the ancient territory of Assyria, Armenia, you see the DNA of people in central 
and South India. Y DNA L1 from the father. The DNA of the Greeks is seen in Iran, in parts of Iraq. Didn't the Greeks invade Iraq and Iran all the way to the Mauryan Empire with Sir Lucius I, Alexander the Great, and the Diagoti generals? You can look it up, it's in the history books. So notice how we see X, E1B1, A1. The Nigerian Eagles have E1B1A and also X, E1B1A. Same DNA as African Americans. But the Nigerian Eagles, they have Hebrew in their language and they have Egyptian in their language. Now, did the Hebrews spend a lot of time in Egypt? Did they marry Egyptian women? If sometimes you marry a woman of another nation, sometimes that mother will teach the child how to speak their dialect, their language. Sometimes they'll learn how to speak both dialects, the father and the mother. So, in the Egyptian language, the evil language, you see Egyptian ku, evil, the wu, die or kill, be, wu, to become, fen, to fly away, aru, wu, anu, kuli, ku, to rise, ku, gu, dance, rejoice, dor, dornor, sit down, settle, amu, umu, children, ka, greater, higher, stronger, above, ani, land below, miri, water, in going inside, inside the house. I actually asked an Igbo man to verify this being true, and he says yes. The Igbos also have Hebrew. You say, well, sir, uh, how do you say six in your language? They say isi, Hebrew is she isi. You say, how do you say ten? You say iri, Hebrew say asiri. You say, how do you say children? They say umo, Hebrew says amo, Israel, children of Israel. You say, how do you say I in Igbo language? You say anya. Hebrew with I am. Stranger, Zor. Hebrew, Zor. I have received Nata, Hebrew, Nata. Looked at, Nebed, Nabat. Same thing in Hebrew. Seventh day, they say Asa Bota. Asa Bota. Today is the seventh, the Shabbat. The Shabbat. Ibo. They say, well, how do you say Gar Mahom? They say Chira Ugam. Chira Ugam. Same, same thing like the angel. Guardian angel, Kuru. How do you say Jacob? Kiko Obi. Hebrew is Yakul. You say, how do you say uh, uh, Israel or, or how do you say Israel? They say, is there a relay? Is there a relay? I say, what does that mean? They say, because you have conquered or prevailed. Why was Jacob's name changed to Israel? Because he prevailed. He prevailed. It's a great description. Home is Ebai, like Bai, or Big, life. The living source of all life, they say chi. In Hebrew, kai or chi is similar to life. Kayim, a lot of Jews will say kayim, meaning to life. Light or fire, they say uri. In Hebrew, it's also or uri. To say fire lantern, in Hebrew, say uri mumu. Yah is good, they say tobiya. In Hebrew, tobiya means yah is good. So African Americans will be taken from the slave coast of Nigeria, Cameroon, Congo, Gabon, Ghana. Our DNA is identical to people in Africa. E will be 1A and L2, L3 for the, the maternal habit from the mother. Now, I'm going to go to another group of people, and I want you to just look at this video, and then I'll show you why. Aboriginals here to push their social progression agendas. 
Um, it's all about the one, it's all about love, it's all about unity, but in fact nothing happens here. I know Kevin Rudd got up in 2007 as Prime Minister and just... Okay, no, 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 no. But basically what he's saying is that uh, Australia originally is from the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Reuben. Now, if you look at this bus right here, this bus was found in um, a four, they say it's 45,000 year old lot of human from Western Siberia. Why DNA C, maternal DNA U. And the maternal DNA you will see in the Ethiopian Jews, also see in the Malabar Cochin Jews of South West India. But the DNA, the Y DNA C, is the main DNA you see in the Australian Aborigines and also some Native American Indians. Notice that his forensic bust looks more like an Aborigine or a Negro uh, than a Caucasian. Right? So we look at Yenisean, this is Siberia, same place they found this man, they had white DNA C. The Native American Indians say that they traveled from Israel and went east and they eventually crossed the Bering Strait going into the Americas. And here you see Siberia, you see Mongolia in the Bering Strait, and then this is where you see a real version of the Nandini tribe, which also has the white DNA C, the maternal DNA A and B, which is also seen in the time Indians. Now, when you look at here, remember before I said pre-pottery Neolithic period C, this corresponds to Israel. Let me see if I can go back far enough. All right, here we go. This is pre-pottery Neolithic C, the white DNA C of the Australian Aborigines. So if you go to the map of pre-pottery Neolithic C, it corresponds to Israel and the Middle East. What is the DNA of the Australian Aborigines doing over here? they live in Australia today. Well, they found evidence of the Australian Aborigines DNA in northern Israel near Megiddo. Near Megiddo, right here. This is in, of course, this is in the, Jew the Jewish people museum in Israel. They don't want you to know the truth, so they keep it in their museum. See the, see the Hebrew writings? So they know the truth. They probably look at the reason for DNA. So we look at Sinium, Sinim is Sabem Yo Nun Yo Mem. The word Sinim is used in the book of Isaiah 49 12 to describe the location that some of the children of Israel will be gathered from back to the Holy Land, Jews from Israel. Some say it's the south, some say it's the southeast, some say it's the southeast or just in the south. Some people say it's the Philippines. The Latin Vulgate describes it or translates this word Sinim as Australia with the, with the A not on there which denotes the South. The Greek Septuagint listed as the land of the Persians. Why would they say that? What does Sinu mean? Well, if you look at the Latin Vulgate, it says, Dentra, Australia, land of, of Australia, or Australia, which is the South. The Greek Septuagint says land of the Persians. Hebrew says the South country, Sinu. So when you look at the Paleo Hebrew, it could be if you go according to the Pig Hebrew, to protect worship of Yah, to continue seed life, to worship Yah via water. So did they go all the way over here to, so they keep the commandments, but eventually the British came and said, what you're doing is pagan, you gotta stop it. We're gonna take over your land, we're gonna start killing you guys, we're gonna put you guys in the middle of Australia, away from the coast, where it's nothing for you guys to do. So how many of these men are of Australian Aboriginal origin? How many of these men you think are Australian? How many of those people you think are Negroes? Is he a Negro? Or is he Australian person? Is he a Negro or Australian person? Is he an Australian person? No. Who about him? Who about him? No, so it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. So I look at it. Well, the Australian person is undergoing a religious ritual of circumcision. This tribe called the Warmoga tribe. In the Madhuja tribe, part of the is a right of manhood, just like many Bantu tribes in Africa do to this day. A lot of them do it on the eighth day. The same day that they name their child, they don't reveal the name of the child until the eighth day, on the eighth day, they circumcise. That's a Hebrew tradition. That's not an Egyptian tradition. That's not a Christian tradition. And they're holding him down when they put the circumcision. And they're also pinching his nipples so that the pain is deferred to here instead of down here. And he's biting on a stick because it's painful to do 
circumcision without anesthesia. Imagine getting circumcision without anesthesia. So we look here, you see that Dr. Dick Reed, a linguistic expert, found that ancient stories of Arshad and Bergen to be similar to the stories of people with Semitic ancestry, including the Hebrew Ishmaelites. Like most Semitic civilizations, like the, the story of the Great Flood by the East Indians with Manu and the great fish Vishnu, the aboriginals tell of a great story where they had a flood where the gods caused, caused the seas to rise, causing a great flood that changed the way the landscapes looked before that time. None of the aboriginal stories told of the sea shrinking to expose new land after the flood was over. The concept of a heavy outpouring of water from the heavens above and a quick rise from the sea level globally has been attributed to the great flood. This is not a coincidence. They took, a, they took a, a DNA from a lock of hair from a nine-year-old Negro in Australia and Brittany and was tested at the British anthropologists at the University of Cambridge Douglas. They said the DNA of the hair was compared with Asians, Africans, and Europeans. It was found that the hair was most closely related to African hair than Asian and European hair. If this is the case, it means that Australia Aborigines migrated from, from an area where the people had woolly hair. In the Israel of the Middle East, Arabia, and Africa, the Hebrews, the Israelites, including the Ishmaelites, were mixed with the sons of Ham. The Habakkuk Sea is also seen in Indonesia, Melanesia, Micronesia, Polynesia, and also the Nadine Indians. And they also found in the white DNA Sea in the Dravidian South Indians. And they say there's a genetic connection between the Indo Australoid people, meaning South India and, and the Australian Aborigines. These are Australian Aborigines, they are brown skinned people. A lot of them have curly or straight hair like the Dravidian Indians in South of India. And they migrated from this area all the way to here. And some of the people branched off and went this way as well, mixing with the local people of the land, women of the land, which the Israelites did. So the wide DNA sea was found in biological skeletal samples in ancient Greece, Persia, Iran, and the Gaza, the Riptep area, circled right here, of Western Iran. The YDNA sea was also found in Israel, samples dating back to pre pottery Neolithic period C. 2 Kings 17 6, the ninth year of Hosea, king of Syria, he took Samaria, northern Israel, and carried Israel away into Syria and placed them in Halah and Hamor. Gozan, which is in Syria, Babylon, and the city of the beast, which is Persia and Iran. This is the Australian version right here. Notice we have sea in India, sea in Australia, sea in Melanesia, Polynesia, Micronesia, and then going across this way with the direction of the Native American Indians into America. So America is a British corporation. The British also put the Australian Aborigines, like the Negroes, into captivity. Research black burning, you see that the South Sea Islanders also were enslaved by the British. Same thing in America. The Christian visual reigns supreme all across the world. And we see that if you look at the maternal DNA from the mother, you see that L3 branches to M, which is the same DNA of the Australian Aborigines, the same DNA of the mother in South India. And also we see in East Africa, the Bounces people. L3 goes to M, L3 goes to M. Now, they also found skeletal remains of the Australian Aborigines in Atli Yam, Israel, which is right here, near Haifa, Israel. The city of Atli Yam falls into the ancient territory of the tribe of Manasseh and the tribe of Asher. Remember that Manasseh was an offering of Joseph, the Israelite, and the Egyptian woman. While investigating the Aboriginal courses in Australia in the 20th century, Professor Elkin of the City University came upon Aboriginal tribes in Australia displayed Semitic Mediterranean features with Egyptian words in their language. Today, the Australian Sephardic Jews don't have no Egyptian words in their language. They have no maternal DNA that shows that they have mixed with anybody in Africa. The Canaanites, the Egyptians, the Putites, or the Kushites. Moses' first wife was, was a Kushite, right? Kushite. Kush is in Nubia, Sudan. The people of Nubia, Sudan are very, very, very dark. Not the black Arabs in Cordial Sudan, but the real Kushites in South Sudan. So you look at, in Australia, they found pictures of the Tarim shipping vessel used by the Phoenicians and the Israelites under King Solomon. And they also found the word tin written in Hebrew in the caves of Australia. And it was a known fact that they used tin in the temple. 
here, Ezekiel 22, 20, 10, Numbers 31, 21, 22, the iron, the tin, the bronze, the lead, everything shall pass through the fire. The priest, he leaves the priest. So they found these rocks with pictures of the ancient shipping vessels that King Solomon used with King Tyree and Ezion Eber. They also found Paleo Hebrew letters. Of course, they're always going to term it as Phoenician. They found it in South, Southern Australia. And they also found it also in Northwest Kimberley, Arnhem Land, and Cape York, Australia. King Solomon made a navy of ships in Ezion Eber and hired him in the navy in service shipping and had knowledge of the sea in service of Solomon. This is what a Tyree ship looks like. Amongst the symbols also they found in ancient Australia was a symbol, the ancient paleograph, not modern Hebrew, but ancient paleo Hebrew letters for Nikash, which is copper or bronze, which is abundant in South Australia, as there are many copper and tin mines in Australia. So why would the Australian universities write the symbol for bronze and copper and tin if they had been land and they were the Hebrews that wrote this on the walls in the caves. Not the Ashkenazi Jews, not the Sephardi Jews, these were the Australian Christians that wrote this in Australia, not the British. Same thing as Isaiah 49 and 12 talks about sin. Tin was also found in Haifa of Israel, which is a different territory of the tribe of Manasseh, the tribe of Asher. How did they get there? How did they get there? So we also look at the genocide of other Israelite people. The Tibet Tasmanians were related to the Australian Aborigines. You'll see that the British also annihilated and killed off all of the Tasmanian people. Does anybody know about Tasmania? The island that's below Australia, where the term Tasmanian devil comes from, and the Tasmanian tiger that can open up his jaw real wide and has stripes. So, why did the British come to these lands and just destroy the people and enslave the people? Because the British knew who were the real Israelites. Before Hitler killed six million Jews, Leopold killed over 10 million Congolese Israelites of the tribe of Judah, the kingdom of the Congo. And he amputated countless hands of millions of people. But they don't talk about this in history in school. They don't say anything about this. Matter of fact, the Congolese have not gotten enough reparations from the, de from the Belgian. Here we see the hands that the, that the Belgians did cut off the hands of the workers so that they can be threatened to work faster and work more productive. But under the Obama administration, out of our taxpayer dollars, Obama approved more reparations for Holocaust survivors that shouldn't be reparations for Germany, which they, which they already are in terms of reparations for Germany, but the United States people are paying for also more reparations for Holocaust survivors. He's supposed to do something for the black people, but he didn't, what did he do for black people? No reparations for black people. And this is a video, an interesting video that um, a whistleblower. Um, this is how many years ago as well. Uh, uh, anything from five thousand people like this. Back then? Back then. So that was a big organization. And, and, and what kind of operations were you doing? Well, it was kind of the operations we were involved in uh, who's taking over countries for other leaders. We were involved in Mozambique uh, spreading uh, the AIDS virus through medical conditions. We were involved in uh, Angola with Dr. Savimbi for various operations. We were in the support. So, people were killed during these operations? Uh, definitely. We didn't mention them. Well, that, you're okay. looking at them. There was a unit in Mozambique uh, from Sinai that uh, one of the things was that we went into African countries. And how was that done? Exactly. Through inoculation. Through vaccines? Yeah, through vaccines. You can need to inoculate people and. The idea, idea being to kill black people? Yeah, to eradicate them. You must understand the concept was that AIDS was a killer. It was incurable at that point in time. So it was led to believe that if you infected people, it was the, it was the quick, non militaristic uh, approach to eliminate that people. And that is something you know for a fact that AIDS was actually the issue. Yes. Right to yes. 
they basically kicked these guys to Jordan and Saudi Arabia and, and Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. These are the original people living in the land. The original people, the black Semitic people. Now this is a picture of what the Jews would say. They say that they're Canaanites, but they're not Canaanites. So we always talk about the walls of Jericho, and we know about Rahab and Israel. Notice how the boy was very dark skinned, but the Jewish guy said he's a Canaanite. He's a Canaanite. Now this is a video of a Native American Indian. Their daughters to their sons. I mean, they had 
should be with Canaanites. So who are the Canaanites? Not the population, seen in the people in Mozambique and Malawi, also seen in Polynesians and then American Indians, Aztecs and Mayans. We talk about LA2, maternal DNA B, seen in South Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia, where the ancient blacks lived in the Angkor Kingdom, uh, if you were in the Mon Kingdom, if you research the Mon Kingdom, M O N, and the Angkor Kingdom. In Cambodia and Vietnam, you'll see that there were people that were little, they were actually black, little blacks and tall blacks in those areas. And so you can still see people that look like black people with Asian features and woolly hair. If you know Vietnam vets, they'll tell you, especially black ones, that we saw people look like us in Vietnam and also in Cambodia. Now, take, take a look at how the X is across his chest. I'm going to show you the reason why. So the, the Canaanites and the Israelites crossed through Asia. They sure did. Now, if you look at the skull right here, the skull is short, but it's long in this, in this like this longitudinal aspect, but it also has prognathism on the jaw. If you look at the skull right here for Caucasian, the skull is a little bit shorter, and you don't have prognathism on the jaw, because the jaw is behind the line of the nasal bitch. That's called orthogonathism. Now you look at Spain, if you look at the word for Spain, espana, espana comes from the Hebrew word for coney or rabbit or hyrax, because in the old days the rabbit creature was called a coney or a hyrax, it was an unclean animal. When the Pygmies got to Spain, they called it espana, and then later it was called Spain, but it was the land of the rodents or the land of the rabbits the land of the rabbits. They got people in Spain uh, that eat rabbits for a delicacy, the Basque people. Now look at this little small island called Ibiza, which is basically the island dedicated to beds. The island dedicated to beds. So the first settlers in Ibiza was the Phoenician Canaanite settlers who settled around 654 BC, and they called it the island of beds, dedicated to beds. During the Stone Age period, Ibiza was only a visiting place for sailors dedicated to trade. The Greeks called it Formentera, the Patristic Islands, which means islands covered with pines. In 64 BC, the Carth Carthaginians established and founded Ebo Sim, the island of Bess, in honor of the Egyptian Canaanite god Bess. Then by 146 BC, by the Romans, who Ibiza surrendered peacefully. If you look at the Peter Wars, Allowing to maintain the social system of culture for some time. Now, Bez, the king that got Bez, which also was practiced worship by the Egyptians, was seen in virtually all the coins of the island of Ibiza, and he carried an image of an African Negro looking god called Bez, hot belly, bow legged, and short, holding a snake in his hand. The peculiar portrayal correlates to the fact that, the, that Bez originated in sub Saharan Africa were the pygmies, whose morphology Bez replicates, replicates because Bez was a pygmy god, were famed for performing the dance of God. Hence his association with singing, dancing, and revelry. So the pygmy tribes, they're known to dance all the time. This is in the first movie that I did, he was with Black America. And you can see here in Lebanon, in Baalbek, Lebanon, and in Israel, in the Turkey, Hittite land, the Hittites, Turkey, Baalbek, Lebanon, Baalbek, Lebanon, Lebanon Baal, the thunder god of, of the Canaanites, you'll see his picture as well on rock, a little short African looking pygmy guy. Well, if you research and read the book by this lady right here, she spent, she might have spent 30 years or 20 years with the pygmies. And this book right here, I think it's a thousand dollars if you try to get it. And the African pygmies were present in ancient Egypt and in Israel. You can see this in the first dynasty as on Narmer's palette. The ancient Egyptian language was called the Belodetta. The word for pygmy or dwarf was the neg. The African pygmies or the neg were also noble and craftsmen entertainers in Egypt, Kemetic culture, meaning they danced around for the Egyptian pharaohs of Egypt. And they also had several ancient Kemetic deities or netta, netta means god in ancient Egyptian, who were dene or pygmy dwarves. So the ancient Egyptians called these little pygmies the dead, and their god was Bess. The ancient Egyptian Canaanite god Bess was also a deity that was also worshipped by the Nubians, Kush, Kush, Mitzrayim, Canaan, the sons of Ham, and Put. Bess was a 
respective households, mothers, and children. The ancient Egyptian god Ptah was initially a, 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 a pig. There was also the ancient Egyptian deity Ptahki, who was seen as the younger form of Pa, and also as the synthesis of the deities Ptah, Sokar, and Asur, the symbolic of creation, stability, and death. There were also the seven dwarves, the pygmy sons of Ptah, called the seven Kedumo. According to the pygmies, Tim was the first Egyptian cosmic serpent on pyramid walls that was a benevolent sun god. When Ra came, Tim's view changed to that as, as an evil spirit or evil serpent named Apophis, who does not want to, does not want Ra to be reborn. Only after, he, only after he has been drawn through the serpent body of Apophis in the Dua. This is the ancient primary god of the ancient Egyptians, the serpent. Remember the, the Egyptians had the cobra on their head? Yeah. And you see here, Set is spearing Tem as the enemy of Ra. Ra is right here. This is Set. So the pygmies were present in Egypt since pre dynastic times, documented by the discovery of the Sand Bushmen people. The Sand people are in Africa, they have the Asian eyes, the Bushmen. They are back to 14,000 to 12 BC, within the Nile Valley. The ancient deities such as Pesmi God Best, originally hailing from Egypt, Nubia, and Canaan, was referred as the oldest of all Egyptian deities. A particular household children, the statues of nurturing um, Best appear to be in the households of Nubia and Norse as entertainers, which Tribes do. The answer is Now, if you look at the land of spirits and gods, it was first envisioned in heaven and not next to any part of the world. Man, so let me get to the good part in a minute. So here we see the spiritual development of the ancient Egyptians in Ebos ultimately traces back to the guidance of pygmy moors formed by thousands of years of clearly observing cause and effect. Proto qua meaning the proto. Qua language was the language of the indigenous pygmies at the Niger Bedou conference. Now, what's the Proto Qua language? The Proto Qua language is the languages of people in West Africa that had Hebrew all throughout their language. If you look at the Qua language families, you'll see that in the Akan, in Ghana, the Shantis, the Fantis, the Ebes, the Fan, the Homi, the Ni, Gadame, the Gadra, the Aja. They all speak the Kwa languages, which if I get to it, you'll see all the Hebrew in their language. So before the Kwa language speakers were known as speaking Hebrew, these pygmy tribes were the ones that were speaking this language before them. And isn't Phoenician the same as Hebrew? If you look at the charts, Phoenician and Hebrew looks very similar. Here we see the Mandingo, the Mandingas, to say lion, they say jato, jato. In the Akan language, they say yata, yata, yato, yato. In the Ebe, they say they say aja, aja, or yata. So you see the Igbos, and you see the Bakongo. They got a lot of Hebrew. House of God, Beatus, Beatus El, the Kingdom of Earth. The Kingdom of Israel, Congo, Dia, Natolia, the sons of Israel, Ben the Congo, Cush, they say Gubi, Canaan, they say Kanana, Moses, they say Maza, Queen Sheba, they say Makina, Saba, Matthew, they say Matiatu, Jesus, they say Yisaya or Yoshiyahu, like Yahushua, Yeshua, thank you, they say Londa, Tanda, like Tanda, kids, they say Benny, Sabbath, they say Samba, Faith, they say Minu, like Mimona, means faith. Judah, they say Yahunde, like Yehuda. Mary, Coela, a bride, in Hebrew is called Kala, neglect, Boeza, Giza. The Exosa language in South Africa. Mitzvah, steps or access to take and graduate a child to accountability age, like the Jews do. In the Exosa language, Mitzi means steps to take. In Hebrew, Asa means to do or to make. In Exosa, it means in process or to do. In Hebrew, Akab means he who falls upon the heels of one. And in Exosa, Akab means some, someone who simply follows another. Jacob grabbing the heel of Esau. 
Hebrew Pesach, Passover. Exosa, Pasika is for Passover. Hebrew, we say Kodesh, set apart holy. Exosa say Narkosi, Narkotosi. Hebrew, Pal, Palal, Nafal, Tofal. Falala, to fall down. Hebrew, they, for Exosa, they just use the consonants Yahushua or Yahusha for Jesus. Because ancient Hebrew didn't have vowels. You couldn't read. You, you, you just basically said the vowel points. But it was all consonants, like the ancient Egyptian language as well. It's also Peniel, see God. Remember when, 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 Joe, when Jacob was wrestling with, with the angel, and then he, he touched, touched his thigh, and he, he called it Peniel? That's when you see the face of God. So for the Exosa language, they say, Mepeniele, to feel or be with God. Hebrew, Shabbat, Exosa, Sabbatane, Sabbath, Sabbath Hebrews. In the Exosa Bible, when Christ says, Eli, Eli, Samabachman, whatever he says, he says in your Bible, it says, this is for the Sabbath keepers. This is for the Sabbath keepers. He said, your Bible is not corrupted like our King James Bible is corrupted. So when Jesus Christ said, Sabbath, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it basically is for the Sabbath keepers. Hebrew, Manah, Aaron, Exosa, Baka, Aaron, son of Aaron. Hebrew, Yehuda, Exosa, they say Yehuda. He, and I just went through this already. The Ebe, to say good greetings in the Ebe language, which is the Kwa language, they say, Eboka Nato. Hebrew, they say, Eboka Ta. In the Hebrew, the way you say Hebrew in the Ebe is Ebe, Ebe. In Hebrew, is Ebe. See you later. It's the same thing. In the beginning, Ber Alishi. In Hebrew, it's Bereshi. The, the first language of the Ebe language is Alesh. No, it's Ale. It's Ale. Ale, this is the first letter of their alphabet in Hebrew is Aleph. To say good or well, you say the tor, Hebrew is tov, congratulate, nizah tor, mazel tov. The ten name, tribe of Sierra Leone, to say teacher or chief, they say rabbi, Hebrew, rabbi means teacher. To say Jew, the ten name say Yehudi, Hebrew say Yehudi. Israel, Israel, Hebrew, Israel. Teacher, more, Hebrew, more. Good news, the Basora. The good news, the Bessor. I, B is Ami. Hebrew is Ani. So be it, they say Amina. Hebrew say Amin or Amen. To bless, to make great the Sierra Leone mother tongue, they say Bakar. Barak means to bless. I or Ilis, they say Ayin. Hebrew is Ayin. To say Egypt in the Temne language, the mother tongue, they say Mishra. Hebrew is Mitraim. The Arabs say Mishri. Prophet, in their language, they say Nabi, in Hebrew, that's Nabi. Creator, they say Yehoah, Yehufa, Kuru, Masaba. In Hebrew, Yehoah, Father, Oka, Hebrew, Abba, Angel, Malaika, Hebrew, Malak. Saba, Saba, Spirit, Ruhu, Ruach, Weeping, Baki, Baki, Jesus, Yeshua. It's a lot of information. If you look at the Phoenician alphabet, it looks similar to, to Hebrew. It's similar to Hebrew. The three statues of the dwarf god, Ptah, you see Pataki, we talk about Pataki, all of them are dwarf gods. The maternal DNA LOA can, can be seen in the Pygmies, the Mabuti, the Biyaga, and also in the Ibiza Island, the island dedicated to Bess, the Canaanite Egyptian Pygmy god. Also, it can be seen in Carthage, Tunisia, also in Israel, and also in African American Bantus, Negroes. If we're the Israelites, then we should have evidence of mixing with the Canaanites in our DNA, which we do have by the LOA and the 9BP deletion. These are the Pygmy tribes in Africa. This guy right here took skulls from Carthage, Tunisia. He said they had a short face, they had doly coats, a thousand. But then he said that the faces were doly coats, so also found like a part napkin, which is the same features as the Pygmy tribe skull. If you look at the Congo people, the Bakongo people, they also have mixed with the pygmies. And because the Israelites have mixed with the pygmies back and forth, you'll see pygmy tribes with the DNA of African Americans, Negroes, even you were named. Pygmy tribes, DNA. That means that a pygmy person had an Israelite father. A pygmy person had an Israelite father. So even though he might be a pygmy, he had an Israelite father. And what did they say in Judges? Did the Israelites took the daughters of the Canaanites for themselves to be wives and also for the sons. 
And that just like with Abraham had a child, and he would have passed down the paternal DNA of the Israelites to the Canaanite man or, or son. Here we see the influence on the Carthaginian, the Carthaginian, I don't know how to pronounce it, Carthaginian. Carthaginian. You see Ibiza, you see Spain, you see also to North Africa, but here in Carthage, Tunisia, where we know about Hannibal uh, the leader. And so in the Journal of Article of Anthropology of Central Africa, Pygmies in the Belgian Congo by Paul Shabesta, he describes the Pygmies, head, shape, and jaw as dolicocephalic and parcatic. Wait a minute, when you go back to go back to this guy that went and found, he said 100% of the skulls that he examined in Carthage, Tunisia had the same skull pattern as the Pygmies. So who was in Tunisia? The car, the car, whatever it is, they were people that were, people, some people say Israelites, but I say they were the Canaanites. So this guy right here, he's a Swiss anthropologist, founder of the Museum of Ethnography, the first important chair of Geneva. He said that when he went to a museum in Carthage, Tunisia, he looked at the sarcophagus of the priestess of Tanya, and he said that the woman who was buried in it presented Negroid features. She was of the African race. The Hasta people who have the same DNA as the Pygmies, they say that when Ishoye, the creator, saw this, the meaning that the wickedness of the world, that the giants were killed in the flood. This is what the cousins to the Pygmy tribe people say. And they say that the Hasta people also claim in their mythology that there was a Bamsus Negro man named Zanzu, who defeated the giants in the former land of their people. This falls in line with the Hebrew Israelites coming to the land of Canaan and being told by God to wipe off the giants and the Canaanites, but they didn't kill all the Canaanites. They were intermarrying with the Canaanites. It's also written in the book of Amos, Numbers, and Joshua. Here's a Canaanite head bus. Here's a Carthage Phoenician Canaanite. Carthage. These are not Sephardic Jews, Ashkenazi Jews. These are Negro people. This is Hannibal, as you can see, the ancient coin depicts Hannibal, Marcus of Carthage, North Africa, the world's youngest military general. He looks like a Negro, they roll on elephants. But wait a minute, we see a lot of people that say that the Native American Indians are Hamites, the Canaanites, the Egyptians, the Cushites. But this guy's not like a Native American Indian. This guy doesn't look like an American Indian. And when you look at the American Indians, these guys right here, they didn't eat pork. If you talk to the Taino elders in Puerto Rico, they say we eat pork. I asked the guy, uh, um, the Spanish interpreter, I said, what foods don't you guys eat? He said, we don't eat pork. That's a tradition that we kept for a long time. But guess what, in the Caribbean, the staple diet is what? Pork. They eat pork all day long in the Caribbean. It's like we do in America, with pork chops, the, the, the slave trade food that Negroes were always eating. So they, they were unclean for seven days after menstruation or childbirth, feast harvesting based on the moon cycle, divination, medicine man, shamans, geomancy, woman, thumen, temple day of rest, one god, high priest, chief, long hair, representing the strength, Hebrew speaking, Haya, Haya, Yehovah. No, they were Israelites. They were brown skinned Israelites. They're not Hamites, they're not European such as that. People need to wake up. This is an ancient Seminole Indian, brown skin, Negro, and some of the features, also some Asian features, straight hair. They say, oh, they should use bear grease to make her hair straight. No, they didn't make Indians that straight hair. So if you know somebody that is not, you know somebody that knows that they have some Native American ancestry, they'll say, oh, my grandmother has straight black hair. She had jet black straight hair. And even if you talk to Caribbean blacks, and they say, well, we have a little bit of Indians. You know, the Indians were also in the, in the, in the Caribbean, in the Granada, in Tigua, Jamaica. And you say, well, my grandmother, she always had straight black hair. She never had an afro because there was some mixing with the Indians and the Negroes in the, in the islands, the Caribbean. This is a little, uh, I know it's getting back, I'm trying to wrap it up. Uh, this is a video as well from the Mormons, bring the young ones. Linguistic evidence that ties Mesoamerica uh, 
who is a Latter-day Saint and is an expert in the Utah Aztec languages, has been preparing them, not just with Hebrew, but with languages cognate to Hebrew, such as Arabic. And he has concluded that there are a lot of remnants of the Hebrew language that one can find in the Utah Aztec language. As a linguist, I have found considerable evidence of Hebrew and Egyptian in at least one language family, uh, Utah Aztec. I have not yet published my findings for the linguistic community. The U.S. Second Language Family is a language, uh, about 30 related languages that are descended from what linguists call quote the United Second. Uh, their geographic location ranges from Idaho in the north to Mexico City in the south. Basically, there are a few dialects in those places. Um, about half of them are in the southwest United States. So there are you getting who speak in Hebrew and Egyptian. The Ashkenazi Jews don't speak Hebrew and Egyptian. If they speak a language that's also cognate to Arabic, Arabic is derived from, if some of you might say, Aramaic or Kufic or the Tibetan the the Semitic language of, of South Arabia, North Arabia, but nevertheless it still comes from the original language of Abraham, which is Hebrew. So we look at Lamentations 3.13, he has caused my arrows of his quiver to enter into my ranks. This is, this is a bow and arrow, this is the quiver. This is where you put the arrows into, it's called a quiver. These are the bow and arrows. The Native American Indians are known for their bow and arrow. These are the Northern Kingdom Israelites defeated by the Syrian soldiers. These are the depictions of the Northern, Northern Kingdom Israelites that is only seen by people in Latin America, in, in like Brazil and places where they speak Spanish and Portuguese, because they don't want you to go to truth and see these pictures of Israelites with the feathers on their headdress like the Native American Indians. Headdress, bow and arrow, quiver. Quiver's right here, quiver's right here, bow and arrow. Just as Lamentations 3 13. It is right bows and arrows, and it has swords. The people in Africa also practice putting feathers in the air, whether it's a whole bunch like the Kikuyu tribe in Kenya, or in other tribes that might have one or two. Just like the American Indians. The people in Africa, the Bouncing people, they practice totem, totemism. So totemism represents your tribe, your clan, so it could be your token, could be the leper, or could be the elephant, could be the monkey, could be the lion, could be the hippo. That was your totem that represents your tribe, your clan, your people. The same thing, totemism is also practiced by Native American Indians. And if you look here, this is how, how the relief looks. Uh, this guy that speaks Spanish and Portuguese, he had to send me this stuff. And this is basically 2 Chronicles 3, 33. Yahuwah, this is Assyria, this is Babylon, this is Vanessa. Here we see Psalm 124, 127, arrows, quiver full of them. We see here, Second Chronicles says, The king of Assyria took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. These are the Taino Indians. They have the fetters in the air. They also use bows and arrows. Obviously, you can see that they don't look like Spaniards. They don't look like, like Ricky Martin. They don't like, I mean, they sort of like Jennifer Lopez, but these are the original Taino Indians. This is the Taino Indian guy right there. Here he is again with melanin in his skin and sort of dreadlocks. He says that he is from the Savannah Sabah, Grande Taino tribes who claim the house of Joseph, of Ephraim, and Manasseh. The Spanish came there and they, they conquered. That's why they call them the conquistadors. Now, you notice that the DNA of the Native American Indians, which is Q, you can Google this, why DNA Q, Native American Indians, why is it, in, why is it found in people in Iraq? Why would the DNA of Native American Indians be found in people in Iraq? Because at one point, the Native American Indians lived there. They traveled to there. So if I'm an African American and I lived in Iraq for a while and I just slept with a lot of different women, had children, and just said, okay, I'm about to go. Or say I was in the military, I went to Vietnam, I slept with a lot of Vietnamese women and had children, then guess what? Those sons are gonna have my DNA walking around, even though they might look today like brown skin or Vietnamese women. And so the same thing happened with the Native American Indians. They traveled from Israel, got exiled to Babylon, to Assyria, to Medes, Persia, Iran, and they mingled with the women of the land and they kept moving. And so you see the remnants still left around in Iraq as the Y DNA Q, which is seen by the Native American Indians in Iraq. This is the Family Tree DNA Project of Iraq. This is a map of Iran. Notice here is the Y DNA Q, which is blue, which is a dark blue. And if you follow the, the, the line, you see blue, blue.
they saw they heard thunder and lightning and like wow. So because the Hebrew word for thunder and lightning is kol, Q O L, koliyah means the, the voice of God, which is also the thunder of God. So thunder, hearing thunder is like almost hearing the voice of God talking about. This ancient place in Hebrew, and you see how it looks here, and then this I'm gonna end with this. In the Pygmy tribe's language, they wrote, the lady asked them, how do you say k -k in your language? And they wrote in the sand this symbol right here. They wrote the sand in the symbol. And they said that it, it represents a cup hand because in the old days they would use a symbol to offer up offerings with their hands open facing up to their gods. This is the same thing what Ka represents. And then the lady, the lady that spent time with him, he said, how do you say moon, moon in your language? And the guy wrote down on the sand, he wrote this right here. And they said, why, they said, why are you why are you writing that? He says that it, 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 it's the moon pronunciation and it represents water. And they said because in ancient times they had a shrine to the rain gods on the Mulanje mountain in Malawi. Mem means water in Pingo Hebrew. The Mulanje mountains in Malawi, South Africa. They said, well, how do you say t -t? And they wrote down this symbol in the sand. And they said that, that they wrote a letter T because the same way, but it's, I'm trying to see whether I'm putting that on It's the language of South Pole. It's the language X was a, X, when they put that down, the corresponded to T, which was the language of the ancient Pigmy tribe priesthood called the Sapitwa. And so, if you look at the, the evolution of hieroglyphics in Pigmy Hebrew to today, the modern Jews, they don't understand Pigmy Hebrew. They read and speak this. They don't understand what this is because they're not the original people. Uh, they have learned how to speak Hebrew, but in the old days before they went to Israel, because they are from Central Asia, Yiddish is Slavic, Turkish, and German name mixed with Hebrew. So their real mother tongue before they went to Hebrew school, what they learned was a Slavic tongue, a Turkic tongue, and a German name tongue because there are, are people that are a mixture of the Turkic nomads in Central Asia, the Slavic people in Eastern Europe, and the German people in Eastern Europe, or Prussia, or Germany. And they went to Hebrew school, and they put in Hebrew, and learned it, and they called it Yiddish. So if you ask them how to say bread, if you ask an old Jewish person how to say bread, she's gonna say roten, and Hebrew is Adam. That's Adam, blood, bread. And I'm, I'm, what time is it? 804. Okay, wait a moment. Um, I don't know if Luke, Lucas, he's outside. Um, is there any questions before we wrap it up? Because I know it's late. I know this is a lot of information. Um, and what this slide is, I'm basically breaking down eat before the E happened with, with Tibet. In Tibet. And who else went to Tibet? The British. They went to the kingdom of Sikkim. Sikkim. Notice how a lot of these people in Tibet, this guy right here, you notice how he looks? See how kind of dark he looks compared to this British guy right here? It's a reason for that. And I talk about the Hebrews that also went in a different direction and they did a lot of mixing with the Asian people uh, in Siberia, Mongolia, and China um, that were described to be the Hebrew Israelites, but their appearance had changed over time from leaving their land a long time ago. A long time ago, but their, their Hebrew group goes back to the beginning of the e Hebrew group, which is seen in the so-called Hebrew, Hebrew 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 Hebrew. All right, all goes back. Look, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm all done. It's just, I think it's brain overload. <laughs> Well, tomorrow, say it please. Tomorrow, I, I want to cover some of the, the time, the Israelites, the last days, and all that stuff, um, signs of the times. Yeah, you know, that's, yeah. If, if I got the time, I could probably touch on more of that stuff. What were you thinking, bouncing off that PowerPoint I sent over to you, some of that other stuff that'd be like parallels? Yeah. Yeah, 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 no, that's fine. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut this feed for this one. You're done for sure.